today, um, I want to look at, as it were, the behind the scenes of Bible study, um, about the how to do a Bible study. Now, I don't know if you've ever been or you've ever seen a documentary and and, or you've seen the behind the scenes of a movie being made or something like that. Uh, When Kath and I were on holiday in Weymouth, we went to the Sea Life Center and we paid an extra few quid and got to go behind the scenes. And so behind the scenes, you see stuff that's very interesting, but stuff that you don't normally have. Sometimes all you see is the the finished product of uh, a Bible study. And, um, but in terms of, so we, you know, like the, uh, the aquariums that we went to, to look at, um, when you go behind the scenes, you see what makes it happen, what makes it work. You see how, what they do when they have the new uh, creatures come into, into the uh, aquarium and uh, how they deal with them, how they make sure they're not, not poorly, how they look after the ones that do get poorly, the water filtration systems, and you see all that kind of thing. You see some animals that you wouldn't see if you were um, on, on just going on the normal uh, routes around the place. In other words, you get to see some nuggets of uh, interesting things that actually add to the, to the value. And so today I want to kind of have a little bit of a behind-the-scenes look at what happens when we do a Bible study. So the aim is, as you've heard from, hopefully from Rick, is that actually it's so that you are a self-feeder. So that you can study the Word of God for yourself. So that you're not looking to Jonathan or anybody else for that matter for you to get to know and understand your Bible, for you to get some gold nuggets out of the Bible that you can actually do that for yourself. And so that's why uh, Rick is going through these things in our small groups. Um, Been fantastic, hasn't it? It's just about pronounce it and, and, and what else is there? Probe it, pronounce it, practice it. Picture it. All the, all the different ways, isn't it? Fantastic. Of just doing it, helping us to kind of get a little bit deeper and to think about what's going on. And so, um, so that's what I want to do today. I want us to kind of go through that. So it's a little bit more of a kind of a, um, a practical side to, uh, to things today. So basically, because the Bible is a supernatural book, you're never ever going to get to the bottom of it. Um, you know, I'm, so what I'm saying is, is you, you people have studied um, maybe one book of the Bible for 40, 50 years at a scholarly, a scholarly level and still not been able to glean everything uh, from it. In other words, you're never going to get the bottom. There's always some wonderful things to bring out of that. Um, uh, but in, in each uh, Bible study that you, that you do, there are basically four things, four steps to go through. And the first one is observation. The second one is interpretation. The third one is correlation. And lastly, application. Yes? So the first step in any Bible study is observation. Observation is quite simply saying, what does the text say? What does it say? And you write down what you observe. Yes? In any particular passage that you are doing. The second step of Bible study is interpretation. Interpretation is when you ask the next question is, what does it mean? What does it mean? And so you're probably saying, well, doesn't the Bible mean what it says? Well, the answer to that is no. For the simple reason, you can say something, but its meaning is not always evident. Yes? Um, (coughs) so So the answer is, the Bible means what it means. You're all going... Oh, okay. So, in other words, when we're communicating uh, to, to each other, we're often using analogies and metaphors and all sorts of things, uh, ways to, um, to, to communicate things to us. And so, we use all sorts of phrases that actually, if they were written down and you didn't have a context to it, which, of course, you will often find with the media, they will take something out of context and tell you what that is, and you have only got half the story, yes? So in other words, if I said to you, you're pulling my leg, you can interpret that in a number of different ways, can't you? You could say, you know, somebody reads that later on and thinks to herself, okay, is somebody literally pulling his leg? 
But we know that means that you've, you're teasing me, you're playing with me, you're, you know, you're, you're kind of, you're just trying to kind of, uh, you know, make some, some, some kind of fun of it. You're just, you're just kidding. So, for example, like the word pin, yes? What does that mean? Well, you could read the word pin in a text, but without context, you're not going to know what the word pin means. So, for example, you can have a rolling pin. You can have a bowling pin. You can pin the donkey. In fact, there are over 60 different meanings just to the word pin. So, in other words, if we were in a wrestling match and I pinned you to the floor, and you're all going... You couldn't pin me to the floor. Did, but, but what I'm saying, what is it? The word pin has now taken on a very different meaning. And that's what I'm trying to say with the word of God. We've got to understand when, when the words are used that there is a meaning to that word that is not always necessary, self-evident, without looking at the context. So we've got to look at the context of something, yes? So what does it say? What does it mean? And third step is, what are the verses explain it? In other words, we compare the Bible and the the rest of the, the Bible to whatever it is that we're reading. We need to correlate the verses. We need to look elsewhere. In other words, the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. Yes? So that's what we look to. Does the Bible have anything to say about this anywhere else? So we interpret a, a, a text that's not very clear with text that is clear, yes, so that we understand that. And often there's even things like the law of first mention, which can help you massively uh, in doing that. So that's one of the ways, one of the principles, should I say, of interpretation, is we un- interpret um, an unclear passage with a, in, in the light of a clear passage. And the fourth step in Bible study is application. That's where we say, what am I going to do about it? So we ask, what does it say? We ask, what does it mean? And then we ask, what does it say about that elsewhere? And then we ask, how does that apply to my life? What am I going to do about it? So no matter what Bible study you're doing, they're the four steps that you need to look at. And so I just want to kind of um, to, to go through that, and I want to use uh, Philippians chapter 2 as an example for you to be able to kind of see that uh, working and see it in, in, in practice, as it were. Okay? So, for example, the background for Philippians chapter 2 is Paul is writing from a city called Rome. Anybody heard of a place called Rome? <coughs> and where is Rome? Rome is in Italy, yes? Unless they've moved it. Okay? So Rome, that's where he's done. Now, he, Paul, wrote much of the New Testament. Um, but he is writing here in prison. And so he's in prison in Rome. He's waiting for a, an audience with Caesar because he's appealed to Caesar uh, because of a situation he was previously involved in. And so he's hoping to get out. But, of course, uh, it's been a long time, and there might be chance that he doesn't. So all the churches that he has planted, he started lots and lots of churches. He's now writing to those churches to encourage them and to find out what's happening uh, to them and some of the reports that he's had back he's able to, to respond to and, to and to kind of talk into their situation. Yes? And so this is a letter to the, to the, um, to the city and to, to the church of that's that's in Philippi, yes, and uh, so Philippi is in Greece. So he's in prison in Rome, and he's writing to the people in the church in Philippi. Yes, so that's the background. So you might want to get a background, and to, in other words, to know the background of a text. Some of this you can get from the text, but if you were just to open Philippians, you wouldn't know that from just reading Philippians. At all, but that's where, for example, having some background and even just a basic uh, Bible Bible study, uh, um, you know, you can buy a, a Bible that's a, it says, you know, study Bible. You will find that on them that generally speaking, in the beginning of each book, they will give you a bit about the author and the background and the culture and those kind of things to help you. Yes, so so they are they are really. 
um, uh, worthwhile getting yourself a study Bible. Now, there's different study Bibles. Uh, some are better than others, of course. But, uh, but getting a study Bible has lots of, uh, lots of benefits to it that can help you. Um, as, you, uh, as you go through that. But one of the things that I find is, is before I read a thing, uh, read a book, uh, I'm able to get a bit of a feel for the background and the culture of that. So let's turn to Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to start reading at verse 19. So are you with me? I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, because Timothy is with Paul in Rome, and he wants going to send him back to Philippi, yes? That I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have nobody else like him. This is Timothy is talking about. Who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. For, <coughs> excuse me. For everybody else just looks after his own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. But you knew that Timothy has proven himself. He's proved himself as a son with his father. He served me with, with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I can, see how things go with me. I'm confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. He's hoping to get released. But I think it is also necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker and fellow soldier who's also your messenger because you sent him to take care of my needs. Epaphroditus had gone there to see Paul with an offering from the church in Philippine. And so he says, so he carries on. For he longs, Epaphroditus, longs for all of you, he's homesick, and he's distressed because he heard that he was ill. Because he heard, because you heard, sorry, that he was ill. And indeed he was ill. In fact, he almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. So welcome him in the Lord with great joy, and honor men like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ risking his life to make up for the help you couldn't give me. This is quite simply, as you can read that, it's a personal note from Paul who founded this church to the people in the church. Yes? And so it's a little bit like me. I go over to, uh, to let's say I went over to Sudan, ended up in prison, and I'm writing to you guys. Yes? Uh, and you're all hoping that I end up there, I can tell you. But... Um, but <coughs> But so you might be asking the question, well, if Paul is just writing a personal note to the church back home, why is it in the Bible? Why is it there? There must be a reason for it because we have just looked through, haven't we, that all Scripture is God-breathed, it's inspired, it's come from God. So if he's in there, it must have a reason for it. Amen? And so we've got to understand that. So just... Just more than anything else, it's important that we understand that. Now, just on a side note, what I've got down here, Epaphroditus comes from the Greek word that means from Aphrodite. Aphrodite, she was um, a Greek goddess, and so he was obviously not from a Christian family. He's obviously come from a Greek or a Gentile background anyway, and yet it is all inspired, isn't it? And Romans 15 verse 4 uh, says this, <clears throat> for everything, not some bits, but everything, is written, everything in the Bible was written to teach us so that through the endurance and encouragement of Scripture, we might have hope. In other words, it's put in there to encourage us and to give us hope. That's why it's in God's Word, yes? Now, you might be saying, well, I didn't get any encouragement from that. I was just Paul writing thousands of years ago to a, to a church that uh, I've never heard of and I've never visited and, uh, you know, I don't know anything about them. So you might be kind of working, uh, wondering about that. Well, <clears throat> this actually, I think, is a very powerful passage for particularly for the guys. So today, we're going to talk to the guys, Yes? So you ladies can listen in 
nudge your husband at the appropriate time, of course, and, um, and, uh, and kind of listen in to, to this. Because Paul is talking about two guys and, uh, and the importance of what they meant to, to him, yes? So we start off, obviously, by observation. What does it say? This is the first step. Yes, so we would read it through several times, this passage, just to get a feel for it, to just to try to get it in. You know, we would, we would picture it, we would, um, you know, paraphrase it, we would kind of look at it and just try to read it through to get to know what is it saying. That's all we're asking, yes? And so what I would do is I would write it down. And I see three things in this passage. The first one is I observe that Paul intends to send two men to Philippi. Would you agree with that? Would you concur with that in the passage? Yes? It's just an observation. There's nothing more to it than that. Verse 19, he says, I hope to send you Timothy. And in verse 25, he says, I think it necessary to send Epaphroditus to you. Yes? So he's saying, I'm sending them back home, these two guys, the great guys, uh, welcome them back and, um, and, and look after them. The second thing that I observe is that Paul endorsed these guys as role models. Yes? In other words, role models who deserve honor. In verse 20, Paul says this about Tim- Timothy, I have no one else like him. I don't know about you, but when I read that and I understand the bigger concept of who Paul is, And uh, Paul the Apostle, probably the greatest Christian who ever lived, obviously beside Jesus, but he is such a phenomenal figure in history. And at this time, that if Paul says, you're a man to be honoured, oh, wow, he is really setting up Timothy uh, onto onto another level. Yes, so we need to pay attention to that. We need to think, okay, Paul's talking about this guy in such elevated terms, yes? Because he does talk about other guys in another passage where these guys left me. They deserted me. And so he's open. He's an honest guy. um, And they're there in the text for us to see. And then, of course, in Epaphroditus, he says in verse 29, welcome him and honor men like him. Honor men like him. You see, Whatever these guys are doing, it's clear as an observation of the text, without going any different, d- deeper, that they are unusual, that they are unique, that they are special, that they are not the norm. They're going above and beyond. Paul's impressed with them. <coughs> so naturally, it makes me ask a third observation question. So what are these guys like? Does the text tell me anything about what these guys are like. Why are they so special? Why are they worthy of honor? Why do they deserve to be praised? Uh, What are these guys doing in their lives that deserves this kind of praise from the Apostle Paul? Well, when we read the passage, we actually find there are five things that we observe in the passage, yes? The first one is in verse 20 and 21. He says about Timothy, He takes a genuine interest in you. So there's a guy, first thing, Timothy, what's special about him? He takes an interest in you. Secondly, verse 22, he has proved himself. That's another characteristic that I observe from the text about Timothy. Third, verse 25, he says, he's my brother, my fellow worker, and my fellow soldier. He's talking about Epaphroditus there. And then in verse 26, again talking about Epaphroditus, he says, he longs for all of you and he is distressed. And then verse 5, it says uh, that about, about him again, it says, he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life. So there are five observations of these two guys. That's all I've done is observe it. What is the text saying to me? Yes, write it down. Yes, so Paul's taking two guys talking about two guys, he's on about sending them back to Philippi, he endorses endorses them as the role models, and he says we ought to honour them. So that's, that's, and then he gives the five uh, characteristics of the good qualities of these guys. So that's just observation. Are you with me? Second, then, we go to interpretation, yes? In other words, what does it mean to us, yes? Well, this passage gives us five marks of what it means to be a man of God. 
So what does it mean? If you want to be the kind of person that God blesses, the kind of person that God's going to use, the kind of person that has God's power in you, then it would be good to study this passage to know what is it that's actually happening there. What are these characteristics that men of God have in their lives? Yes? So we've observed, observed them, but now what does it actually mean? So verse 20, Paul says about Timothy, I have no one else like him. Yes? Why no one else like him? Well, he says, because he takes a genuine interest in your welfare and everybody else only looks only for their own interest. So that's rare, that's unusual, that's different. There's nobody like him. Why? Because he's taking a genuine interest in the people of Philippi. He's not looking after his own interests. He's not thinking about himself. He's thinking of other people. That's not normal. That's not what most guys do. So here Paul's noting that these guys are very different, and particularly he's talking about, uh, about uh, Timothy. And so you've got to kind of uh, go through it. So, of course, one of the ways you interpret Scripture, uh, and to help you with it, particularly because we have the English language, is you can, you can compare um, translation with translation, and we have numerous translations, so you're able to look. So even if you don't know Greek and, and Hebrew, we're in a privileged thing to be able to look at it and think, okay, this, the, you know, um, if you're reading the message, Eugene Peterson, he interprets this. If it's, um, uh, you know, if it's the NIV Bible, they, those, those scholars, they're interpreting it that way. They, they're seeing, they're trying to bring out the meaning of the text. Now, some translations are more trying to be literal. They're trying to do word for word. Uh, some translations are more paraphrases, so they're more interested in trying to get the meaning of the text than others. So it's good to have a number of translations to help you to see the meaning behind them, yes? So in other words, he often takes a phrase to explain a word. And let me explain, just simply, is there are around 11,000 words in the Hebrew uh, and Greek, uh, you know, in, in the original languages for the Bible. But in our modern translations, in fact, in, in, I would say in all of them, their averages, uh, the English is around about 8,000 words. So if you've got 11,000 and 8,000, what does that say to you? That says somewhere along the line, there are some things, because you can't do word for word, and for those of you that are linguistic experts understand that, that actually you can't just take what word is said in one and put it into another. You're trying to get the paraphrase. And so in the English language, it comes down to around about 8,000, but we're not fully able to explain because the English language is often very simple in comparison to the Hebrew and the Greek. So let me explain to you. For example, if we were to use the word love, what is your understanding of the word love? Because the Greek has five different words for the word love, and we only have one. So it helps you to see that. So I can refer to things. I can say, I love my wife. I long at the same time, I can say, I love ice cream. I can say that I love alpha. I can say that I love football. So what I'm saying is I can use the same word, and yet it has different meanings. And of course, we understand the meaning once we get the context. And so in, the, in these original languages, the, the words that are used can help us to have a fuller understanding and meaning. So if you don't know Greek, guess what? <laughs> Why not learn it if you're able to do and you will get the fullness of some of those things. But with our English language, it helps us. So in Greek, we have, sorry, we're four words for love. We have the first one is eros, which is where we get erotic love from that, sexual love. We have storge, which means strong love. It's a bound love. Filio, which means brotherly love or, or, or friendship kind of love, in other words. So when you have, what kind of love that? Well, it's like Philadelphia. It's cheesy love. No. <laughs> I thought you'd like that. There you go. I wasn't sure whether you'd get it. Agape, and the fourth one is agape, which is unconditional love. And so that is the issue. So when Jesus is talking to Peter, he actually uses two different uh, Greek words for love 
in the different settings. But all of these words are used in Scripture. So we need to check out different translations to try to help us to get a better interpretation, a broader view of what it means, yes, uh, in that. I mean, what we do have nowadays, of course, we have... Uh, we have Bibles that actually will have like the uh, Greek and Hebrew interlinears. So you can actually, if you can read the Greek and Hebrew, you can see the Greek on one page and you can read the English on the other and see how they have interpreted it. Um, but again, it's still their interpretation of what's, of what's there. So the beauty is having many translations. Yes? Okay. So an example of other translations of this verse, for example, it says... In the TEV, it's on your outline. Timothy genuinely cares for you, while others only care about themselves. Or Philip's translation says, they're all wrapped up in their own affairs. Yes? So it's just giving you that bigger picture of understanding of it. So there are five characteristics of a godly man that come out. So let's look at that. Let's look at how... We can go deeper. So first of all, a godly man is caring. A godly man is compassionate. He's, he's unselfish. That's what this, we can get from this. He cares for you while others care for others. In other words, everybody has their own agenda. And most people, are, they're only interested in their own agenda. But here he's saying Timothy's not interested in his own agenda. He's interested in the agenda of other people. Yes? So you, most people are interested in their own business, their own studies, their own career path, their own family, their own whatever it is that's in their little world. Um, you know, and, and even in marriage, most people are interested in how that marriage benefits them rather than thinking of the other Person, yes, our culture teaches it's all about you. That's the difficulty with it. Advertisements, they're what they all do. You look at the advertisements, they're trying to say, You deserve this. You, your life would be so much better if you had this, or you went there and you flew here and you experienced this and you did that, whatever. In other words, they're trying to sell you something that's going to, that's, that's for your benefit. They're not thinking, and of course they're thinking of their profits, of course, they're not thinking of what it actually means for you. So you've got to be aware of that. That's why, um, for, for some of us, we like to talk to the telly. Yes? And when there's some adverts and we go, you must be kidding. Yes? And, and, uh, and, and uh, you know... So that's in, in, in important to, to be aware of. So this is rare for, to have an unselfish man. Yes, talking to the men. It's rare to have an unselfish man. And all you ladies are going, quiet. Thinking, preach it, preach it, preach it, but I'm staying quiet here, I'm staying quiet. Okay, let me talk to the single ladies that are in the house. Yes. Okay, how to identify a selfish man, yes, before it's too late. That's, that's the thing, yes. Once you're in it, you're in it, you know. But um, So you might want to write this down, or you might want to just uh, uh, listen to it on YouTube afterwards or whatever. And the first one is, does he only talk about himself? If all he does is, and, and I, I tell you, I've met quite a few, and that's all they do, they talk about themselves. Does he ever open the door for you? Yes? <laughs> Has he ever bought you a meal because he knew you were too busy to get something sorted for yourself? He sensed that you didn't have time, so he thought, I'm going to sort lunch out. Or does he ever go out of his way to make you feel safe? To make you feel secure? Does he ever ask for your opinion? (laughs) (laughs) Does he ever ask for sex? If a guy, I'm talking with the single girls, obviously. If he ever asks you for sex, yes, he's a loser. Yes, because he's interested in what he can get, not what he is going to be able to add to your value. And if he says, you will if you love me, 
then he's a double loser, yes? And if you say no and he gets upset about it, it's a triple loser, okay? <laughs> so, so what I'm saying is, is there's, you need to ask yourself about these, think about them, and if necessary, run the other way. Seventhly, will he cancel his plans if you're sick so he can take care of you? One here for the Borough fans, <laughs> especially as it's come up to 12 o'clock. <laughs> for you Borough fans, would you guys, would your, would your uh, boyfriend, would, would he miss the game for you? That's touched us our point, hasn't it? <laughs> Is he obsessed with his appearance? Is he always looking in the mirror like Fonz? Will he do something that he doesn't like to do just to be able to spend some time with you? That's an unselfish man. Does he pick up his mess? Or does he expect you to pick it up for him? Uh, these are things about to look at. Be practical, because the problem is, once your heart's engaged, it's hard to get the rational in. We see it over and over again, yes? That once your heart is engaged and you're in a relationship, all you see is what you want to see, but you need to ask some reality things. And this text should hopefully help you to think, what is a godly man? What's a man worthy of honour like? And the first thing is, he is caring. Secondly, God is looking for men who are consistent. This is the second thing that we learn about Timothy, is he is consistent. Verse 22, Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of of the, the gospel, or the God's Word translation says, you know what kind of person Timothy proved to be, yes? The word proved means he's been tested, yes? Verified, reliable, dependable, he's faithful. And so the greatest ability in life is dependability, yes? We're often looking for all sorts of other skills and other abilities, but if you're not faithful, if your guy's not faithful, guys, if you're not dependable, if your word is not your bond, if you don't do what you've said you're going to do, you're not an honourable man. Because honourable men do what they say they're going to do. They are reliable. They turn up when it's time to turn up. And they're there at everything. So we've got to, got to look at that. Yes, there is a difference between having a conviction and an opinion. If you have an opinion, it's something you're happy to argue about. If you have a conviction, it's something you're prepared to die for. So let me ask you guys, is there something in your life that you're willing to die for? Have you got something in your life that, you are, that will make you so live because you are willing to pay whatever price? Have you got the conviction in your heart and in your life for that. So he's a caring man, he's a consistent man. And then he says about Epaphroditus, I send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother and my fellow worker and my fellow soldier. He's looking three metaphors here and every one of them is about relationship. It's about being connected. First of all, brother. In other words, we are, they're, um, they're committed to each other. A fellow worker, a godly man is committed to serve together. A fellow soldier, someone who is committed to the cause. Yes? So this is thing. He says, he is also your messenger because you sent him to me to take care of my needs. And so there's cooperation involved. If you find a guy that's a godly man, a man worthy of honor, he's a man who will cooperate. That's our third point, cooperate. Yes? Why? Because the Christian life is based on family, it's based on ministry, and it's based on a fight. And we are in a fight. So we're on family, we're related. The phrase brother and sister appears 133 times in the Bible referring to Christians. For thousands of years, people in churches would refer to each other as brother and sister. So you would say brother Jonathan, and you would say sister 
Frida or whatever it might be, yes? Um, so you're, you're looking at that because they were terms of endearment. Now, sometimes uh, you would find um, uh, that they might say, oh, yes, your brother Harris, which, of course, is not as thing, is it? As if you're using your personal thing. So today we don't do that, uh, but it's actually probably a good thing to do if it enables you to understand relationship. We are brothers and sisters in Christ, yes? We are, it's not, this is family for eternity, Yes, we are together for life and after death we are together. So it's important that we under, understand this. And so the Bible talks about that. We are to treat older women in the church as mothers. We are to treat older men in the church as fathers. We are to treat younger men and women as brothers and sisters. So when you start to look around, in other words, at the, the other aspects of the church and compare it and, and put it into this text, you're starting to see a bigger picture of what is happening, yes? So we're on a mission. We work together, we fight together, we have a con- common enemy called <coughs> Satan. So we're to support one another, we're to encourage one another, and that's why we have small groups, That's why they're so important to us, yes? So a godly man is cooperative, yes? Uh, He he doesn't just look after his own events. He's not a lone ranger. He's not doing his own thing. But he actually is part of a team. He's a team player. He wants to be in. He doesn't say, I don't need to go to church. I don't need to be in a small group. I don't need uh, to read my Bible. I don't know whatever it might be. I don't need anybody else. That kind of person um, is just proving that he's ignorant about his own needs. Because we need each other. Yes, the Bible makes it clear that I need you and you need me. We add things to each other. We benefit each other when we are together. You have strengths that I do not have. Yes, so some of the strengths that you have, I would just dream of having. And, uh, and vice versa, I've got strengths that you don't have. I'm not sure what they are, but I'm sure there's someone in there anyway, yes? But in other words, godly men get along with people. They cooperate, they're team players, they love to be part of the team, to contribute to the bigger pictures. They're not difficult to get hold of. I want to tell you, companies pay big bucks for people who are good with relationships. If you're good with people, companies will pay for that. Because that's what they're looking for, is how do you relate to people, yes? That's why salespeople uh, are often paid so much. Why? Because they're good with people, yes? They know how to be able to relate and to be able to, to get you on the same wavelength and sell you something that you don't want. But, uh, but of course, so Paul was a superstar. Let's remember that. In the Christian world, if there's anybody that could have been a lone ranger, it was Paul the Apostle. And yet he is the one that's telling us, don't go alone. He's the one that had a team. He's the one that had men and women with him. He had people with him on the journey. He was always looking for people. He was working with people. He had a team. And you and I need to be part of Destiny Dream Team. Amen. Amen. Yes. Verse 26, it talks about Epaphroditus and it says, For he, this is Epaphroditus, longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was, he was ill. This church in Philippi in Greece that had been started by Paul um, had, had, had knew where Paul was and his situation, so they decided to take an offering. And they decided that they, would, that they would have somebody in their congregation to go and take this offering. And Epaphroditus, I don't know whether he was volunteered or he was volunteered. <laughs> but one of the things is, is Epaphroditus went on a, on a long, long journey. You can imagine going from Rome to Philippi, going from, uh, from, from Italy to Greece. And you've got to remember There's no cars, no aeroplanes. There's no, 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 nothing there for for him to be able to uh, to to get there. Uh, No trains in them days, of course. Nothing else. So he had to walk it. I wonder how many of us would be willing if your pastor said to you, "We've just got this offering." 
and we would like it to be taken to the church in, say, Germany, and, um, and I need a volunteer. I wonder how many of you would say, Jonathan, I'd go. Or would you in your head start making excuses? Because Epaphroditus was a businessman. So he had to leave his business. He had to leave his family. He had to leave everything to go on a journey to take an offering for the church in Philippi because he was a man of God. Because he understood that that was a privilege to do it, so off he went. And it talks about him actually um, uh, you know, nearly dying in the, in the process. And so that's what's, what's doing. But what it says about this text here, which I think is fantastic, is he is distressed for their distress because they've heard that he's not well. They've heard that he nearly died on the, on the journey. And so they're distressed about Epaphroditus. But Epaphroditus is distressed about them being distressed. That's a man of God. Because he's worried that they're worried. Yes, he's considerate about what their feelings and their thoughts are. That's what an honor, a man of God is honourable for. That's what he, we honour men like that who consider others and think of others rather than just of themselves. They are considerate, which of course is our fourth point. Considerate about what we say and about what we do. Yes? And, and this is so important to us. I don't know about you, but have you ever heard a guy... And he'll say, oh, I just say it as it is. <coughs> I just say what I think. <coughs> well, that's just plain rude. <coughs> that's just a sign of immaturity. Yeah, you just say something and then, oh, well, that's your problem. Can't handle it. But actually, we have a responsibility to not say some things. Don't always say the first thing that comes into your head, yes? Sometimes you just let it stay in your head, okay? And then when it's in your head and you've got... So in other words, somebody might say something to you and they've upset you. And um, in fact, I was reading about Rick Warren and uh, he was on about... He'd gone away to another place, uh, to a part of a music band. And, um, and uh, when he was... Uh, all his uh, musical instruments were in his uh, room at home. And so some guys decided without asking him to borrow it. And he writes and he says to me, he says, but actually I was very upset about it. He says, and I had all rehearsed what I was going to say and not going to say to them until I read my Bible. And then God said to forgive and to think the best and to be willing to go the extra mile. So in other words, it changed everything all because of that. A godly man is considerate. 1 Peter 3 and verse 7 says, Husbands, be considerate as you live with your wives. Why? Because we are not naturally considerate. It's something we have to work at, yes, and to think about, yes, in so many areas. Particularly in marriage, it's probably the number one cause for divorce, selfishness, not considering the other person, yes? You know, in other words, I want what I want, yes, and you want what you want, and the two never meet together. We are inconsiderate in the decisions we make. We're inconsiderate of other people's fears. Uh, we're, we're, we don't take into account that the, we think differently. Men think differently to women. Uh, there's different kind of, uh, uh, you know, as it were, psychological differences going on, the way that we process things, the way that that works in our life. Yes, so let me just give you an example. Let's say you want to go buy some jeans. The man goes straight to Tesco's or wherever he's going. He goes straight to the shop, buys the jeans, costs him 20 quid. The wife goes, and on the way to Tesco's, she happens to pass this shop and that shop and the other shop. So she, by the time she gets to go to the jeans, she's already spent 120 pounds. Why? They think differently. We've got to be considerate of that, yes? Considerate of that and not bring up how much it cost at every opportunity, okay? <laughs> we have to be considerate. 
That's not that we shouldn't have a budget, <laughs> Kath. Okay. <laughs> I just have to get one in there, you know. So let me just think to yourself, okay, the chances of a man winning an argument, what's the percentage? If he's in... If... <laughs> They've got there already. If he's in the courting, dating stage, if he's just dating, friendship, 50-50. If you get engaged, 20%. <laughs> and as you all know, if you're married, it's... <laughs> Don't even bother, okay? <laughs> yes. I always like when I talk to George, he's been married many, many years, and I'd say, what's your secret? He says, just two words. Yes, dear. <laughs> Oh, the other one he says is, I'm sorry, it's my fault. <laughs> so the godly man is considerate. Yes, he's considerate. And George is one of those guys in our fellowship. Ooze is it? You know, I, I come to him and I say to him, I said, I've got, I've got my pen and I've got it on me now. I have a little Parker pen. And I said to him, I said, oh, I've got, in, uh, I've, got a, I've got a blue one, but I've no blue ink. Next minute, within minutes, he's produced three Parker pens. Yes. A black one, a blue one, and a red one. Yes, but what I'm saying is he's considerate. I didn't ask him to do that. I was just trying to, I was thinking, I feel guilty now. But, but that's what's in the heart. It's a heart thing, yes. And so that's important. Now in verse 27, indeed, he was ill and he almost died. He almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help that you could not give me. Circle that, risking his life. That is the fifth characteristic of a man of God. He's caring, he's consistent, he's cooperative, he's a brother, he's a fellow worker, he's a fellow soldier, he's considerate, and fifthly, he's a man that is courageous. He will risk his life for you, for the cause of Christ. He is fearless. Lord, make us fearless. Yes, that's what we need to do. Now, I know many guys, as you do, that will risk, take massive risks for themselves because they are going to benefit. I know guys who will climb mountains, sail the seas, they will surf enormous uh, waves, they will swim in the most freezing of waters, they will swim around the British Isles, they will bet the farm on a business deal because they are going to personally benefit. But to somebody who will take risks and will risk their life for others is rare. And that's what Paul is pointing out. He's saying a man of God is courageous, not for himself, but for the cause, for the call of God, for the church of Jesus Christ, he will risk his life. Let me ask you, will you guys be willing to give everything for the cause of Jesus Christ? I'm not talking about just doing something that gives you an adrenaline rush. I'm not talking about something that you know, you're going to get the glory of or going to make you a lot of money. I'm talking about where it will cost you personally, come what may, in order to serve and to be there for others. I believe it's important that we understand that it is rare. But I believe that God is calling to us as men today to say, let's not make this a rarity in this church. Let's make this church where the men of God are caring, consistent. They, they love the, the people around. They're willing to go out of the way and they're willing to risk their life. Amen? It, it, it says this, he risked his life. I just want to say this, he risked his life. It is a gambling term. It means he hazarded his life, yes? In other words, he was willing to die trying. It wasn't a surety. He didn't know where it come through, but he was willing to gamble his life on it. Guys, don't gamble your life on stupid stuff, but do put it in and risk your life for something that will last for eternity and last beyond it. 
So Paul says, I don't have anybody like Timothy. Yes, we've looked at observation. What does it say? We've looked at interpretation. What does it mean? We've looked at that and all the, all the aspects of that. And then we look at correlation. This is the third thing. Correlation is we ask, is there anything else in the Bible that will help us to understand the passage? So, for example, you might be saying, okay, do we, does the Bible say anything else about Timothy? Does the Bible say anything more Epaphroditus? And that's why I just want to, to kind of highlight some of these things, which I put them through and then I've run out of time. <coughs> but get yourself a good concordance. Uh, Strong's exhaustive concordance has been out for more years than I've been alive. Um, and basically, it, uh, if you get these, what they call an exhaustive concordance, they have absolutely every word, even the word and, and the word the, every time it appears in the Bible. So it's, uh, it's kind of uh, everything's in there. And so you could look up the word Timothy, and it would show you everywhere in the Bible that the, the, the Timothy is mentioned, and the same with Epaphroditus. If you want to do this aspect, in other words, you want to see what the Bible has to say about this subject, what does the Bible have to say about caring, then you can look up care, caring in, in it. If you want to know what it says about consideration, you look up being considerate. So you're looking into what does the Bible have to say and contribute to this aspect of the passage that I'm reading, yes? So there are things. So there are some basic ones that you need. I've mentioned about having a good Bible study uh, book that would be good for you to have. It has uh, just some general stuff. There are lots of different varieties. Um, and if you want some advice, see George. And, um, and um, Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, some basic things. But however, if you go to your... You notice somebody's torn it. It wasn't me. Anyway, um, if you go to page 171, I think it is, have you all brought them with you? Um, 171, might write down 171. It's all in the Bible um, study section, but there's one that says tools for effective Bible study. Uh, worth looking at. It will t tell you there about getting, re you know, some good recent translations and exhaustive concordance, which I've just mentioned. Uh, again, a Bible dictionary, encyclopedias. I mean, some of these encyclopedias are, are out of this world. They are phenomenal. Um, they're expensive, but, they're, but they are really well things. The Bible handbooks, um, things, and commentaries. What I find is, is I like I like particularly like a commentary, say if I'm going to be looking at one book of John, then I'll get some commentaries on the book of John that can, that can help me, and that's what they're, they're looking at. Do you know what I mean? So, uh, so it's worth doing that. However, uh, we do have, <coughs> uh, there's a program that I use, and I've used for quite a lot of years, and there's been others around, but most of them have kind of come and gone, and I've used difference over the years, but this one um, is, if you're able to put it up, it's called Logos. Uh, logos, which just means word in Greek, yes. And, um, and so logos.com you could go to. And, um, and it, it, it has like the Bible software. You can use it online or you can download it to your, uh, to your computers and things. Um, it does have, um, it, you know, it, it, it costs to, to, for, for it. I think the starter pack is about £235, something like that. So it's not cheap, but, but actually... It will give you lots of these things um, in, in the one package. And you can just keep adding to it. And then you can share it in the family, the same login, um, you know, so, so mum can have it, children can have it, granddad can have it, whatever, you know. So it's really useful. It is very powerful. Um, you can spend thousands and thousands of pounds, okay? So it is, it is phenomenal. Bible study alone, without application, I obviously haven't gone on to that, without application is only going to give you knowledge. And as uh, we saw this week, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. So in other words, it has to be about application. And so what I want you to do, just as a simple application this week, thinking about this passage is to think, okay, Lord, you've talked about men that are, that are, and the characteristics of the men that I need to honor. 
So why don't you this week think about the men in your life who are worthy of honor? Yes, it might be your husband, it might be your father, it might be you, you know, it might be your brother. Um, it could be someone else in, in the church. You might have someone in the church. You might have somebody from another church uh, that's been valuable in, in discipling you. Whatever it might be, think about godly men that meet this criteria this week and think, how can I honor them? That's putting the word into practice. Amen. Amen.